Now our, our new uh, interim pastor, uh, Pastor Tim Hooksema. Uh, he's from Fond du Lac, and uh, he's got some energy, folks. So <clears throat> I want you to be, be uh, ready and hop on board, okay? But, uh, yeah, Tim's here, and he's going to be helping us out in the interim pastor role. And I'd just like to invite Tim to come on up. Let's give him a big lakeside welcome, if you would. And Tim wants to get to know us all. I think, you know, he's told us that many times, uh, the leadership and the elders and, and all. Um, so there's actually a sign-up out in the lobby on the table by the couch for, hey, let's go to lunch with Tim. So if, uh, if that's you and you're like, I want to know Tim a lot better too, sign up on the table. That way we can make arrangements, and I think it'll be a great time. Tim's a, Tim's a great guy. So if you would, let's pray, and, and we'll continue on with God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for for bringing us here, for safety on the roads. Thanks for bringing Tim here through the snow and ice and all. And Lord, we just are looking forward to what you have in store for us today. May your words touch each and every one of our hearts. And bless Tim and his time here as the interim. May we be a blessing to him and he be a blessing to us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for such a warm welcome. Um, that is amazing, because that doesn't always happen. Uh, sometimes I'm not warmly welcomed, and um, so this is a great honor to be able to join with you and to see what God is going to do. Um, a year ago, I had no idea that I would be serving as an interim pastor at all. And I'm going to just share a really brief story. I substitute teach in the public school system in Fond du Lac. And I actually, I think, receive a little bit of combat pay because I work primarily in the middle schools. And I love it. I love the energy that middle school students have. And I am so thankful that God has given me a calm heart when dealing with stressful situations. That's something God has done. It's not something I have done. But being involved in the school system has helped me um, understand that I, I desperately need the Lord in the midst of all of life. And I am so thankful to be here. But I, like I said, a year ago, I did not know that I would become an interim pastor. And as the school year was coming to an end, I knew that I wouldn't be able to receive a paycheck from substitute teaching, and our family certainly needed that, and I wanted to find a way that I could contribute to the kingdom of God. And I sent a frantic email late on a Monday night to a friend who is in a, a part of the Evangelical Free Church denomination. I said, Rob, school year's coming to an end, are there any churches that might need help in any way? I received a reply email Tuesday morning from Rob. And Rob said, you know what? There is a church that's going through a crisis. I just learned about this crisis about a week ago. Would you consider serving as the interim pastor in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin? And I said, where's Prairie du Chien? I have no idea. Um, I said, you know what? Uh, point me in that right direction, and I'll, I'll consider it. So we had a family meeting in the car as we were driving, and I shared with our family the opportunity I had to uh, go preach out in Prairie du Chien and, and bring a word of encouragement to that congregation. And that's what I've been doing, and the Lord has been opening door after door of the, abil of the possibility of serving him by joining churches that are kind of in a transition. And one of the focuses that I want all of us to have is that in this time of transition, it's not just a time to wait for the next pastor. God is going to do some of his finest work right now. 
I am fully convinced that he is going to do what only he can do. And the reason I'm convinced of that is because God is faithful to all his promises and he's loving towards all he has made. And if he is faithful and we receive his grace and we receive his love and we receive what he has for us, we're going to continue to grow day by day. And so as we move forward, I'm excited to be with you guys right now. And I'm excited. I already know that God has the right man at the right time as your next pastor. Now the details, who that is and when's that can all happen, we don't know. But we don't need to. God knows. And God will lead us and guide us. This morning, we're going to be talking about something that's quite uh, simple in understanding, but very difficult to live out. We're going to be talking about adore Jesus and make disciples. Around here at Lakeside, I know, um, you know, I already feel like part of you because the elders have welcomed me so well. But this is my first Sunday here, so if you're here for your very first Sunday, I'm right along with you. It's okay. Um, But we're going to be talking about what does it mean to adore Jesus and make disciples? Uh, but before we do that, I want to just introduce you to my family. Um, this is a recent family picture taken at my wife's parents' 50th wedding anniversary party. Uh, my wife, Jenny, is on my back there. We've been married for 23 and a half years. And um, I am so thankful. I realize the grace of God more through her than any other person on this planet. She continually extends grace to me, and it's a good thing because I need a lot of it. So I'm thankful for Jenny. Um, My son Michael is holding our daughter Kelly, and Kelly is a 19-year-old freshman at Judson University uh, down in Elgin, Illinois, and Michael is a 15-year-old freshman at Fond du Lac Christian School. And our, our hope and prayer is that the gospel would transform us, our family, the community we live in, the state we live in, the country we live in, and the world. So I don't know if that's too big of an audacious idea to say we, we expect that God, by his grace, is going to transform all those various people groups. But that's what God desires to do. So I know that he will carry that out. He is a faithful God, so he's going to do his work through us, even though we maybe are not perfect. All right, so when I was a kid, I had um, great joy in taking my little BMX bike, pedaling it as fast as I could, and going off ramps that me and the neighborhood kids would make. And one of our favorite things to do was to lay a few of our friends down under that ramp to see if we could clear them. So we would set up this elaborate ramp, um, which was really not too elaborate and not really well planned out. We weren't engineers, so we didn't know what we were doing. But we laid out our ramp, and then three or four or five of us would lay down. And then somebody would get up the gumption to get on that bike and pedal as fast as they could hit the ramp, and hopefully clear everyone. Um, Usually that happened. Sometimes that back tire would catch the last guy a little bit, and, you know, it would would not, you know, you'd you'd feel it. Um, We didn't tell our moms about this, so please, if you happen to, you know, ever get in touch with my mom, don't tell her. Uh, We don't want her to know that this happened. But I remember one, uh, one summer day, I was roaring up to the ramp, and we had about five guys laid out there, and I thought, I better really get moving. And so I was pedaling as fast as I could, as fast as my little legs would go. I hit the ramp, took off, and I cleared everybody. But as I went up in the air, my, my front wheel went down, and I didn't land very well, and the handlebars hit me right in the gut. And, of course, it knocked the wind out of me. And I'm sure some of us in this room have had the wind knocked out of us. 
you just hope you get another breath of air somehow, in some way, shape, or form. Um, my friends, well-meaning as they were, uh, asked if I wanted water. <laughs> no, no, I wanted air. If there was a way they could get more air into my lungs, that would have been beneficial. The same is true of us as people. We need to breathe in the grace of God and breathe out the grace of God. We need to breathe in his goodness, and once we have his goodness in us, breathe it out. We need to receive God's grace, and after we receive God's grace, it doesn't just stay there. We need to extend God's grace to those that need it. And if you're wondering who needs God's grace, everyone you know, every single human being you know, whether they've been a Christian a long time, whether they don't know Christ, wherever they're at, they need the grace of God. And so my hope and prayer is that when we walk out of here in a little while, that we are breathing. All right, I've got a quick quiz. Um, what happens if you only ever breathe in? Anybody? You will die. If you only ever breathe in, you will die. All right, question two. All right, question two is, if you only breathe out, how long will you live? Probably not very long. God created our physical bodies to breathe in and then breathe out. And we do it without even thinking which is great, because if we had to think about that, you know, sleep would be um, not happening. But we, we are called to breathe in and breathe out the grace of God. We're called to experience his presence like we sang about, and after we experience, experience his presence, we're called um, to go make disciples. So, if we look at uh, the screen, it says, when we experience the grace of God, we can't help but adore Jesus and join his mission to make disciples. I have a friend who said, you know what? I don't think we need to do evangelism training in the church. I said, that's intriguing. Because, you know, a lot of us, we need to learn how to do that. He said, no, we're all natural born evangelists. Every single one of us. If you find something that change, changes your life or find something you get passionate about or excited about, you can't shut people up. They're going to talk and talk and talk. I love coffee. And I don't know about you guys, but I love coffee. We used to have a cafe as a part of a ministry I led. And I drank way too much coffee. And I went to coffee school and I learned how to become a barista and make all those fancy drinks. And I love, love coffee. And I can't find coffee that I love well enough. And so a few years back, I actually became a coffee roaster. And if you want to talk coffee, um, just be ready for a lot of information to come out of me. Um, even if you don't like coffee, you may hear about coffee in the coming months because I love coffee. And so... When we experience the grace of God, when the grace of God wrecks our soul to the point where we are radically transformed, we can't help but worship Jesus. We can't help but adore him for all that he has done and who he is. We also, just naturally, will start making disciples because we want people to have what we have. I want people to have coffee because it's so good. But I understand not everyone loves coffee, so I also love tea. Um, and so if we go out, if we go out uh, for lunch, you'll, you'll probably hear that I'm ordering either a coffee or a tea, and, and we can talk more about that in the coming months, like I said. But the Bible is filled with passages that encourage us to adore Jesus, to praise his name, to bring glory to his name, and this next slide, uh, Psalm 96, 1 and 2, says, 
Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation day after day. This actually, these two verses actually have the adoring Jesus and the making of disciples right in it. When you're telling of his salvation day after day, that's disciple making. You're saying, you know what, this grace of God that makes dead people come alive is available to you. You are dead in your sins, and I want you to come alive to Christ. I want you to realize that what Christ did on the cross can radically transform everything about your life. So, we look at this question that says, why should we adore Jesus? What is the purpose for adoring Jesus? Why? And honestly, we should adore Jesus because of who he is and what he has done. That alone is why we should adore Jesus. For who he is and what he has done. In 1971, um, I was one, so I don't remember this, um, but there was a man by the name of Reverend Lockridge. And Reverend Lockridge worked at a church in Los Angeles, California. And one Sunday he gave a message And he does his very best attempt at describing the character and nature of who our God is. And we're going to watch a very short video clip explaining to us a little snippet. Now, we need to understand, this is a three-minute or so little video clip. We are not going to be able to explain the grandness of God in three minutes. There, there, there's no way. If we had three billion years, we couldn't. And we're going to try and do it in three minutes. So this, understand that this is like one-tenth of one-hundredth of a percent. Like, we're talking not even on the radar. But this video, I think, uh, does a pretty good job at explaining who our mighty God is. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age, he rewards the diligent, and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could 
describing to you, he's indescribable, he's incomprehensible, he's invincible, he's irresistible, well, you can't get him out of your mind, you can't, you can't get him off of your head, you can't outlive him, and you can't live without him, well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him, Pilate couldn't find any fault in him, Terror couldn't kill him, death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! Amen indeed. You know, you look at that, that's just a very, very brief description. That does not encompass who our great God is. That's just a tiny sliver of who our God is. So when I think about that, I think that prayer just makes so much sense. A lot of us um, try to change each other. I know uh, sometimes husbands try to change their wives. I know a lot of wives are trying to change their husbands. Doesn't tend to work, does it? <laughs> no. Um, I know kids try to change their parents, at least change their mind. Um, I know parents try to change their kids. I don't think that that works out very well. I also work in the public school as a substitute, like I said, and I try to change students sometimes, and they're trying to change me. Um, the reality is we spend a lot of effort through our days trying to change others. And the reality is we can't change people, but when we pray to the God of all creation, who is all-powerful, who has all strength, who has all authority over everything, it just makes sense that we would lift our request to him and say, Lord, first of all, start by changing my heart. And then if you want to use me, I'm available for you to use me to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, even to the end of the earth. The important part in that is that he is with us as we go and make disciples. One of my favorite uh, groups of verses, uh, actually Romans 5.8 is my favorite verse in the entire Bible because it shows us God's grace. But Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If the grace of God has not wrecked your life, completely turning you upside down, that's my prayer in the coming weeks, is that the grace of God would radically transform you. I have a friend, his name is Justin. And when Justin was a 10-year-old boy, he did something pretty bad. He knew that his neighbors were away on vacation for a week, and to this day, he doesn't know why he did this, but he knew where they hid their key to their house, so he took the key, he went into their house, he plugged every drain in every shower, every sink, and he plugged the floor drain in the basement, and he turned on all the water supply. And then he left. And he was playing with his friends outside. After about three or four days, um, Justin's dad was in charge of kind of watching the house, making sure it was good while the neighbors were gone. And Justin's dad said, wow, um, something doesn't seem right over at the neighbor's house. There's a smell, there's a something coming, a weird smell coming from there. So Justin's dad opened the door to the house that the drains are plugged and the water had been running for over three days now. He opened the door and found that the whole entire house was flooded. And Justin's dad came to Justin and said, do you know anything about this? Have you heard 
of any, you know, any boys in the neighborhood talking. And he said, nope, don't know anything about it. And went on his way. A few days later, uh, Justin was playing ball with a friend out in his front yard. And his dad came to him and asked him again, Justin, are you sure you don't know anything about what has happened to the neighbor's house? And Justin confessed that he had done it. And he knew he was going to get a whooping. He knew, okay, this is it. Uh, I'm probably going to die. At least I'll be spending the rest of the summer, you know, probably grounded. His dad looked at, his, uh, at Justin and said, Justin, thank you for telling me the truth. I love you dearly. You can go back and play ball. And Justin didn't fully understand what was going on here, but his dad was taking the penalty that was due Justin, his dad was taking it upon himself. His dad was already working two jobs to supply food and a house for his own family. His dad took a third job for the next three years to pay for all the repairs for this house. And he never asked Justin to repay him. And he received that grace from his earthly father and when he realized that that's what grace was about, undeserved favor, he was wrecked right around that same time by the grace of God for his life. He knew what a sinner he was. He knew not only did he flood the neighbor's house, he's, he'd been sinning every day of his life, but he knew the grace of God. And as the grace of God wrecked him completely, he realized that he couldn't stop, but he couldn't help but tell other people about this Jesus that offers grace to those, that, those of us that don't deserve it. There may be people in your life that you'd say, you know what, they don't deserve the grace of God, so I'm not going to give it to them. I'll give it to them when they're able to receive it. I want to encourage you to extend grace to every single person you meet. First of all, though, you need to have an encounter with God. You need to be wrecked by his grace. And as you're wrecked by his grace, it's going to cause you to become an evangelist for Jesus. You're going to tell other people about the goodness of Jesus. Like I said uh, earlier, my wife Jenny is the person that I have received the most grace from. It's because she knows me. She knows me warts and all. And she loves me. And this encounter of being wrecked by God's grace happened to me um, a number of years back. I was driving home, having just received a traffic ticket for speeding. And I was very ashamed of my sin. I was very feeling a lot of guilt. And... Up until that point, I would have hidden the ticket in my glove compartment and I would have figured out a way to pay for it without her knowing and I would have figured out a way to put on a facade. But I called her and said, I, want, I wanted to let you know I got a parking ticket or a, a speeding ticket. And she extended grace to me and as I was driving home, the only place I wanted to be was home because I knew she loved me for me, even though I had the speeding ticket. She still loved me for me. And I knew uh, that I was forever changed by, by that encounter of being wrecked by the grace of God in our marriage. God also invites us um, to make disciples. And honestly, we all need um, Grace upon grace upon grace. Here's a quote from Tim Keller. It says, To be loved and not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything. 
it liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. We need the grace of God in our everyday life. This isn't just something for Sunday morning church. We need the grace-filled gospel of Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, but then to make us new. In Ephesians, it says that we are saved by grace through faith. And in Colossians, it says the same way that you are saved, grow up, walk in that way. So the grace that saves us is not just saving grace, it's a sanctifying grace. God does not say, okay, you're saved by grace, but now once you receive my grace, now you have to figure it out by yourself. He doesn't leave us to ourselves. He says, you know what? It's my grace all the way. Grace isn't the ABCs of the Christian life. Grace is A through Z. Receiving God's grace and extending God's grace is what we are called to do. So, What does it mean to make disciples? One of my favorite passages talking about disciple making is found here. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21. It says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, For our sake, he made him who knew no sin. He made him, uh, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's Christ doing his work through us. As a young pastor, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go do a lot for God. And the more I do, the more God is going to love me. And I worked about 80 hours a week in ministry. It was not healthy for family, marriage, for a lot of other things. It was just not good. Um, But I was finding my identity in ministry. I was finding my identity in what I was doing instead of the one that made me. And... I thought the more I would do for God, the more he would love me. I thought, I'm on a mission for God. My thinking has since changed. Now I'm realizing that God has been on a mission since shortly after the fall, and he is doing his ministry, his mission, through me. In this passage, it says, um, it says, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. I think that is so critical for us to understand. We don't go and make disciples for God. God makes disciples through us. We don't go alone. We go with the power of his Holy Spirit alive in us. And as we go, he makes disciples through us. We get a front row seat to the miracle working God. We get to see dead people come alive. The gospel doesn't just make good people better. It makes dead people alive. That's a foundational difference. And I love that that passage in 2 Corinthians that talks about who we are as followers of Jesus Christ, that we are his ambassadors. We are his representatives here on earth. We are not the source of the light that's going to bring hope. We're reflectors. And if I could, I would have actually just bought a reflector for each one of us so that we'd be reminded that I'm not the one that has all the answers. I'm a reflector to the one who does have all the answers. So, we do not need to be perfect. As disciples of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus is not perfect, but Jesus is. Hopefully that takes some pressure off you, because if you were trying to Live, if you thought being a disciple means being perfect or sinning less, that is so stressful. And actually what you end up doing is you end up sinning. Um, because if you're pretty good at it, you, you develop this sin of pride. And 
if you're not very good at living the Christian life, you're going to feel a lot of guilt and shame. And if we live on our own, instead of seeing, uh, if we think we need to be perfect, what ends up happening is we'll put on a facade. We'll say the church things that church people want to hear, and then we'll know that the real us is hiding behind that. There's a dualistic living. There's the, the, the facade that we put over ourselves so that people never, ever get to know us. So being a disciple of Jesus Christ doesn't mean you're perfect or you never sin again. You're going to sin. But as you sin, you can confess that sin to God and he will forgive you. And he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's something he does. We don't have to cleanse ourselves from unrighteousness. We can't. The best we can do is lie. And that's not good. A disciple of Jesus Christ is also shaped by the gospel because of Jesus. And in the coming weeks, we're going to hear a great deal about being shaped by the gospel of Jesus Christ, letting the gospel shape how we live our everyday life. A disciple is also quick to confess and quick to forgive because of Jesus. Since we're not going to be perfect as people, when we realize our own sin, when the Holy Spirit reveals that to us, we should have a desire to confess to the people that we've hurt and ask for them to forgive us. My wife and I, quite often at our dinner table, it's a time where we confess to our kids how we've messed up. And our kids have developed a new pattern. They are quick to forgive uh, because we're so readily um, able to sin as their parents. When we confess, hey, I am so sorry that I hurt you when I said this. Will you forgive me? Our kids have been... Um, Another place that my wife and I have experienced God's grace as they've forgiven us for our sins. And lastly, the uh, process of discipleship is really about moving from unbelief to belief about who God is and what he has done in absolutely every area of life. Discipleship isn't about us becoming perfect. It's about Christ's perfection making us new day by day. It's about his sanctifying work, making us um, change from what we once were to who we really truly are, our, 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 our identity as followers of Jesus Christ. So I want to challenge every one of us here to intentionally pause to experience and extend the grace of God in our everyday lives. Some of you may need to spend some time dwelling on who God is and what God has done. Maybe your adoration of who our Jesus is needs to grow this coming week. Maybe you need to spend some time going through passages in the Bible saying, let the, let the Bible inform what you know about who Jesus is. Maybe you need to look at 1 Corinthians because 1 Corinthians tells us a great deal about who Jesus is. Maybe you need to look at Ephesians chapter 1 because it tells you who you are in Christ. But I want to encourage you to spend time with Jesus this week. I don't know what that looks like for each person here. Um, mine is a late night after all the kids, after our kids go to bed, my wife's in bed. I have a quiet time. I, I typically go through about one verse in an evening. Right now, I'm in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to, is going to be tonight. Um, so I dwell on that one verse and I say, what does this tell me about who our mighty God is? I used to read the Bible just looking at what does the Bible tell me to do? And then I tried to go live it out. And the reality is, I failed miserably at that. The Bible would tell me, go love your neighbors. And I would not go do that. And then I, the, you know, I'd read the Bible again, and it would tell me um, that I should be humble. And I'm like, no, I don't like that. I don't like what the Bible's telling me, and I can't do it, so why should I try? So much so that I had a difficulty in my younger years reading the Bible 
because I was always reading it as an instruction manual telling me what I needed to do. Now when I read my Bible, the very first thing I'm looking for is who is God? What does this Bible tell me about who God is? Secondly, what does this Bible tell me about what God is doing? And thirdly, what does this Bible tell me about who I am? And fourth, what do I do? If you live just the what do you do part of it, apart from understanding who God is, empowering you to be who he's made you to be, it's an exercise in futility. It's an exercise in, in feeling um, almost condemned by the Bible. But we'll walk through that in the coming weeks. So I want to really encourage you to intentionally pause. Take that time to, first of all, breathe in. Experience the grace of God for yourself. And once you've experienced the grace of God, you realize more of who he is and what he's doing in your life. I want to encourage you to go and make disciples, breathing out the grace of God. Sometimes that means evangelism, telling people about who Jesus is. Maybe they don't know, and maybe they need to know, and maybe you're that person that could tell them about who Jesus is and what he has done. I want to encourage all of us, myself included, to intentionally pause. The first two words on that slide up there, it says intentionally pause. We live in such a fast-paced world that we actually need to intentionally pause and reflect on the goodness of God. And once we receive the goodness of God, we shouldn't just hoard it for ourselves, but we are called by God and we get to join his redemptive mission on this planet Earth by breathing out, by extending that grace to the people that so desperately need it. And the, every, every single person you will ever encounter every day of your life needs the grace of God. They maybe don't think they do, but they do. So I'm going to close in prayer, but thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, for allowing me to join you and join what God is doing here. I see evidence of God's grace all around, even this morning. God is at work through his church. So let's pray to that end. Oh, dear Lord, we thank you that you are with us, that, Lord, in you we have great value and worth. Lord, we don't need to earn our value, earn our worth, earn our identity. Lord, you have given us that by your grace. Lord, I pray that as a result of this morning that we would realize your grace, but it wouldn't just stay there, but that we would extend your grace to those that need it. Lord, open our eyes. Help us join you in what you are doing. Lord, we're not on a mission to make disciples for you. You're on a mission through us. Lord, we get to be your reflectors, your ambassadors. So, Lord, as we go, open our eyes. Lord, there are thousands of opportunities to extend your grace each and every day. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't miss those opportunities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.